Welcome to the Healthier Pregnancy presentation series. I'm here with Dr. Mark Lofman from the Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine, Department of Family and Community Medicine, to discuss the Affordable Care Act covered preventive services of alcohol misuse screening and behavioral counseling. So thank you so much for taking the time today to provide more information on this really important topic. Um, we're gonna be discussing screening processes, um, interventions, counseling, and or referral processes for alcohol misuse, and very specific to pre- and perinatal patients today. So why don't we start by you telling us a little more about your background. Thanks, Sheila. It's great to be here. It's such an important topic, so mm -hmm. I'm really excited to be part of this team. So really, I've been involved in family medicine and obstetrical care for a little over 20 years, mostly in Chicago, working in underserved communities. And um, through that practice, uh, the opportunity to intervene and affect uh, what I would guess health disparities, I think is what we talk about really in terms of perinatal outcomes, brings up the opportunity for integrated behavioral health into primary care. So we've been involved in that pretty uh, aggressively in the, in the Chicago community and also part of some national uh, work through the Health Resource Service Administration on health disparity collaboratives and perinatal care. So all that really comes together. So I'm involved in practice and also in education at the medical student and resident level looking at providing these services. Through all of those experiences, I think I have uh, some tools to share, uh, mostly with our providers. I think I, I can really relate to what it's like for them as they begin to scale up and bring these additional services. And so I look forward to sharing some, what I hope will be helpful tips for them today. That's great. And so why do you think that it is so critical for providers to offer the service of screening for alcohol misuse? Well, you know, we're really beginning to understand the scope of behavioral health issues as, as really as significant as some of the social and uh, biological conditions that patients face. So there's really an epidemic uh, among us when we really, really look at the numbers. So um, there's about um, 85,000 deaths a year attributed to alcohol in the U.S., so it's now the third leading preventable cause of death in the U.S., so from a public health point of view, there's very few things more important to us. And intervention really is it's an opportunity for prevention. So these are things that can be prevented. Uh, reproductive age women drink. Uh, it's part of our social culture. We know it happens. Um, about 30% uh, use alcohol. And, and a significant number of, of women, one in 20 women who become pregnant, report excessive alcohol use before they really knew they were pregnant. So we know it's a neurotoxin. It causes significant uh, neurodevelopmental harm to fetuses. So we have a public health issue. We have a high level of exposure. And we have interventions that we know work. The U.S. Uh, Preventive Services Task Force has given uh, screening and intervention a B rating because um, there's very little harm that can, has been shown and probably no harm that's been shown to be done with it. It's a low risk, a low in a non-invasive screening procedure and the opportunity for impact is so big, uh, why don't we do it? So that's the reason it's important. It's a public health issue and it really fits now as we begin to think about comprehensive patient-centered care fits right in that scope. So it sounds like it's the opportunity to do a lot of good um, with not a lot of harm. So how, do, or, or no harm is what That's you're right, saying. Really. And so how does the screening process work? Well, I mean, I think the key is we have to look at what has made other aspects of screening work. So we now have had a chance to have a lot of experiences bringing new screening into perinatal care. Um, you know, I've been around long enough to remember when some of the genetic testing was really brand new on the scene and boy, it's really just an ever expanding list of things now, biological and gen genetic medical conditions that we screen for in pregnancy. So providers have really gotten comfortable starting to expand and build those uh, resources, but what makes it work really, it's important that there's a system. Uh, there really needs to be a system there. Uh, when we just give providers sort of a mandate and a, and a guideline and roll it out and expect it to be incorporated into the workflow, there's so much of what, what's called clinical inertia that really gets in the way. So we know when we've done things like um, advanced ultrasound screening or genetic marker screening, we have to provide the tools, the resources, the system, really accountability to be able to respond. It's one thing to screen, but when you find a screen, what, what do you do with a positive uh, test result? So what we know works is when the system's accountable, the staff are helpful, resources are available, and the provider has a sense of competence, not just in the screening tool, but what the system can do in response. That's really what it takes, and that's, I think, what uh, today's program is really all about. Okay, and so 
with the screening process, how does it work? Does it work that the patients are filling out this information on their own? Are people in the healthcare system, the providers themselves, administering these things? What's the best way to do this? You know, we've seen a little bit of all of the above, so mm -hmm. all the things you're talking about. And I think what we recommend is to do what you do for other conditions in the, in the practice. So uh, for providers who are sort of on their own, and, and I work part-time in, in a hospital clinic where I'm on my own with my medical assistant, so I have a chance to try it in that setting. Um, then you do what you do. So you, most of those questions are either by the medical assistant or the provider. Mm -hmm. um, the key really is that when you're screening for things, these uh, high-risk behavioral conditions, that it really feels to the patient like it's part of the practice. It's incorporated right into the flow. It's not carved out and treated specially or separately in a way that might further stigmatize this condition. So we really want to break down the stigma and we find, and I think the evidence really supports that by incorporating it right into the flow of your practice, um, that's really what makes it work. So we really encourage doing what you normally do. Who does the genetic uh, screening? Who does the intimate partner violence screening? Um, who does uh, tobacco and smoking screening? Alcohol screening and drug abuse screening should go right into that. Spectrum would flow pretty much the same way. It doesn't take a lot of time when it's incorporated in, and if it's done consistently at every, at every visit the way we do other screenings, um, it just becomes part of the practice and patients begin to understand it's a safe place to have these conversations. And so is there an intervention then that you sort of seamlessly uh, refer people to or how does that work? Well, so it all goes back to the screening and then basically being ready to, to respond to what the positive screens are. So I think mm -hmm. it would be helpful a little bit to talk about what some of that screening is and then, and then absolutely flowing into the interventions. And you, you know, you remind us that any good screening test is only as good as your ability to intervene when found. So mm -hmm. I'm really glad that you brought that up. And um, the SBIRT model, S-B-I-R-T, really um, sort of fits so many of the things we do and it certainly applies well to behavioral health. So in SBIRT, the S is for screening, so mm -hmm. we'll talk a little bit about that in, in a moment. Okay. And then the BI for, is the behavior, uh, brief intervention. And so providers really have gotten comfortable intervening. Um, we counsel about smoking, we counsel about nutrition, um, exposure to environmental and occupational uh, risks during pregnancy. Um, safe, uh, safety in the workplace, seat belts, all, mm -hmm. all sorts of behaviors that we do. And also how to intervene when patients have a positive screen. Maybe a genetic marker comes back, a positive screen. Many times those turn out to be a normal pregnancy, but the marker, because of the specificity, yeah. um, ha has a false positive. So we've gotten comfortable having those brief interventions where we sit down and sort of assess and inform for the patient what that means. So really that's, that's the right part of brief intervention. And for the vast majority of patients, that's really what it takes. Brief intervention needs to be continued if there's a positive screen. And, and we'll talk about that, I'm sure, um, as part of the program today. And then the RT part is referral to treatment. So with any screening, we're going to find patients who really risk out of the practice. And in this case, it's going to be um, problem alcohol use or misuse, uh, and particularly people with alcohol dependency. Folks really, really will need help, will need an intervention, and most practices are not prepared to provide that. Uh, that's where a referral out uh, to a competent source would be used. So for the screening, uh, mm -hmm. getting back to that a little bit, um, you know, the ACOG antepartum record that many people, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology antepartum record uh, that most providers use or, or something like that has some screening questions in there about alcohol. And, and they're, they're certainly better than not asking the questions. We've found some evidence of that, but they're not really the best evidence-based questions that we have. So I think if we're going to do it, we really want to do it right. Mm -hmm. So the U.S. Uh, Preventive Services Task Force recommends the, um, what's called the audit tool, the AUDIT, mm -hmm. Alcohol Use uh, Disorders Identification Test, and the Audit C, which is a pre-screen for that. Mm -hmm. The audit is 10 questions. Uh, the Audit C is the first three of those 10. It's been shown and validated in pregnancy that uh, both the audit C and the audit are, are useful. They're very sensitive and specific. So the, the quick three questions for the audit C um, will really help you rule out uh, an alcohol use problem. And, and then um, the audit can be continued on with the full audit 10 questions if the first three are positive. Um, so these tests are really very useful. There's, there's others. There's uh, one called TACE, T-A-C-E, and TWEAK. Uh, T-W-E-A-K, they have cute little mnemonics to help us remember. Um, the taste and the tweak both bring in the T in there is tolerance, and they really get at the issue of tolerance. And uh, studies in pregnant women have validated that they uh, tend to be open about answering questions about tolerance, and it's been shown that uh, reproductive age women who have built up tolerance to alcohol are much more at risk of having um, 
excess use that could be injurious to the, mm -hmm. to the, to, to the baby and, and potentially a behavioral health problem for mm -hmm. themselves. So tweak and taste are there, and then again, the audit tool gets at this too. One thing I would say in common about the screening test is that um, they're really looking at uh, the frequency of use. How mm -hmm. often do people drink alcohol? Um, how much do they drink? And then what are the consequences of the drinking behavior? So those three things are typically there, and positive screens um, are, are uh, patients who test, or who, who will be assessed and found to have any of those three markers typically are positive, and then further intervention is needed at that time. So that's really the screening setup. Any one of those could be used. We do recommend getting further than the ACOG three questions, and any of these other tools could replace those three in the record um, or be used in, instead of those three. That's really helpful to know that there are a lot of um, good instruments, good validated mm -hmm. instruments out there. Do you find that there are certain patients that might tell you, especially you know, pregnant women or people that have just mm -hmm. delivered, women that have just delivered, that might say, hey, you know, I'm using alcohol to some extent that maybe it, I'm helping right. cope with some very stressful situations in my life, things that I've gone through. You know, what do you do for those women? Are, is that different mm -hmm. or? You know, it's, it's very helpful, I think, to, to have a frame for that because mm -hmm. we are in a, a social culture and environment that normalizes uh, social drinking, regular mm -hmm. use of alcohol. Right. And some circles, uh, much more than others, uh, use that. So I think, you know, part of this is just framing uh, to the evidence that we have. So mm -hmm. alcohol is clearly um, neurotoxic to, to fetal development. So there's just simply no question about that anymore. So fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, the whole spectrum of FASD, and then, of course, fetal alcohol syndrome, is an extreme manif manifestation of that. But we know, we know that it happens. So essentially, we sort of frame alcohol as a, as a neurotoxin to developing fetuses. And if we think about our culture, we have gotten pretty uh, comfortable and, and concerned, appropriately concerned and comfortable addressing um, occupational and environmental exposures during pregnancy. I think people are sensitized to that and want to avoid those things. So I think what really works is reframing alcohol use out of the normal uh, category of, of social drinking mm -hmm. into uh, uh, really what's an environmental exposure, mm -hmm. uh, toxic exposure to a developing fetus. And you know, many people have experience, they know someone, or maybe they've had a prior pregnancy where they did use alcohol and the child seems fine, but it's, it's a high level of risk. And mm -hmm. when we look at the risk and what it's, what it's there and frame it that way, I think the evidence supports that women will reframe their use and, and can uh, uh, approach an abstinence model. Mm -hmm. And I would add also that um, I think it's really important to separate out. Typically in, in prenatal, postnatal settings, uh, we're really thinking again of, of the more typical sense of alcohol misuse. Is there dependent drinking? Is there problem drinking? Is there excessive levels of drinking? Um, but in pregnancy, uh, once a woman is trying to conceive or has conceived, there really is no safe dose. So really we kind of have these dual purposes mm -hmm. with alcohol screening in pregnancy in the perinatal setting. One is really to detect what we're always looking for, which is dependent and problem use that always warrants an intervention. Again, we've talked about the epidemic of alcohol-related disease in the U.S. So that's always going to be there. But particularly around the time of pregnancy from early pre-pregnancy, preconception, any time uh, you know, active family planning is not in place, basically, um, there really is no safe exposure. So it really is unnecessarily putting the fetus at risk. And, you know, we just never know how many brain cells uh, it will take to, to affect the child's development, their behavior down the road, um, their ability to, to perform in school, and, uh, and potentially even some physical uh, manifestations as well. So I think, you know, to your question, we really, in the prenatal setting and the preconception, I would say, setting, I think we're really looking at, at a chance to look for maternal and uh, the future mother's emotional well-being, her perception and health beliefs about alcohol use. It's a great time to sort of get a sense of that and then, and then uh, do some brief interventions if there is a problem. Mm -hmm. Again, we mentioned, uh, you know, one in 20 women report having used excessive amounts of alcohol, clearly toxic levels of alcohol before they knew they were pregnant. And those first few weeks of, uh, of gestation, of course, are, are so critical for neurologic development. So that's important to get. So that's the preconception period. Then prenatally, you know, it escalates. Uh, it's an imminent danger. So if, if, if uh, the prenatal patient is using alcohol at any dose, really, it's a risk. And, uh, and we would definitely move to an abstinence model there. And certainly if there's problem or dependent drinking, uh, really do, it would be a, an urgent situation that would require immediate intervention. And then the postnatal setting, we're still concerned about the child's health, but it sort of moves more into the parenting uh, environment with problem drinking potentially, so we kind of move back a little bit more into the problem and misuse 
and, and not so much focusing on abstinence only in that mm -hmm. case. Yeah, it sounds like you're bringing up a lot of interesting points, particularly about patient education and health literacy, especially mm -hmm. if the patient comes from a background where maybe drinking was the norm in the house that she grew up in or right. you know, the house that she's in currently, and it was just a way to cope with stressful circumstances, perhaps. I think that's why it's so important to talk about this at, at, at frequent visits and just like we, we do with other be, uh, behavioral screening, you know, the, the PHQ2, the PHNL questionnaire 2, or then the nine questions, if any of those, either of those two are positive, you know, kind of embedding that with some, uh, you know, basic understanding of the patient's uh, approach to alcohol. You know, again, it really, alcohol and smoking are two of the most obvious preventable interventions we can make mm -hmm. uh, in, for the maternal and child health outcomes. So we really ought to be uh, hitting on those uh, every, every time we see a patient. That ought to be part of the program. And it really needs to feel to the patient seamless, like this is just part of the care environment. Again, it's a safe place, not judgmental, but obviously concern and again framing as we do any other health concern in pregnancy. Well, so, you know, you're bringing up the point that it really needs to be integrated, but yes. what do you think are the biggest obstacles for it to, you know, th this kind of screening to happen right. on a regular basis? Right. I think we've got a pretty good evidence of sort of what works and then what are, what are those barriers, what those obstacles are for most things. So, you know, we all need more time. There just isn't enough time to do all the things. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, some of the uh, studies that have been done, if, if a provider did all of the preventive health maintenance, right, that you needed to do, um, you, you could see a couple of patients a day. Right. So what we've learned is we have to, to share and we have to integrate and offload. So we can't do it all ourselves. So I think what we've learned to do, and we do this for all of our patients, we do risk assessment, we do triage. Mm -hmm. So for many patients that so we screen, they're going to risk out and we're going to know alcohol is not an issue. We take that off the list and move on to something else. So I think, but for those people who do have an issue, if it is a problem, it's likely to become at the top of the list. Just like the patient whose uh, glucose screening is uh, suddenly abnormal and now we've diagnosed diabetes or um, high blood pressure or, or another uh, condition or an ultrasound finding, uh, you know, shows something concern, then really uh, time no longer is the issue. It's having a work plan, having an efficient system to manage that issue. So I think we just bring it into the scope of things that we screen for, we triage and we prioritize and individualize on a patient-centered basis. That's really what uh, sophisticated health systems are doing today. They're really learning how to, to triage and focus on what's valuable for that patient rather than having kind of a rigid routine that we flow through and push patients through. We really individualize that. It takes help and you know, our medical assistants, uh, registration staff, everybody involved can be trained to be competent to do uh, some of the screening for us. And then I think, um, you know, just as we need a place to send uh, people for genetic counseling or advanced ultrasound or uh, for medical complications of their pregnancy, we also need that behavioral health component. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we wouldn't imagine uh, a patient who suddenly um, has a, um, a complication on an ultrasound. We wouldn't imagine sort of saying, you know, here's a phone book, you know, find somewhere. You got to do something about this, right? We just, we just wouldn't do that. So that's sort of what we want to do with um, things like alcohol use and misuse in pregnancy is sort of take ownership of our side, which would be, here's where I want to send you. This is a person that I uh, trust to help you with this. He or she has the time to take and go through this with you. They will uh, care for you. I would send my family or friends to this person. Those are the kind of things that we want to be able to say to patients. Again, it doesn't mean we have to do it all ourselves, but we do need to be able to make those competent handoffs and referrals for behavioral health issues just like we do for everything else. So the answer, short answer is more of the same. We do what we do. We take a little bit of accountability. We set up a system. We hand off uh, to others to do the part that we can't or, or, or shouldn't uh, take the time to do. And then we follow through. So. I think such important points about, you know, interprofessional collaboration and everybody in the health system being educated on these topics. Are there other resources that you want people to be aware of? Yes, I mean, I think the key again is to, you know, find a tool. I would just walk through the steps. Find a tool that really works in your practice. Again, the audit is, is an easy tool out there. To use the audit C to start. So, and then in service the staff, get people comfortable with that. I think that's the first most important thing to do. Um, and then, you know, kind of have a drill or a, a, a workflow. What do we do when this is positive? And, and be prepared for the intervention. So I think that's gonna be the next step. And that's where uh, resources are going to be necessary. So um, it's really uh, critical, I think, that anybody taking care of a perinatal population have a referral source for behavioral health for alcohol. And kind of what we've learned is, is um, behavioral health tr 
treatment can be somewhat specialized, just like medical care can be. So just because someone is a licensed clinic clinician doesn't necessarily mean that they, they have a sensitive approach to alcohol or addiction disorders and vice versa. So I think knowing the provider well enough to know their scope of practice and what they would do. And you know, Alcoholics Anonymous still has a tremendous track record of success. So that's another quick thing that people can do. So for those patients, and this is always our nightmare, someone's really exposed and uncovered having a severe a dependency or problem use and needs an intervention today. You know, one of the things that's been shown to work is referring to AA. Um, so especially for patients with low resource, um, it's a free uh, program that's out there. Um, every, most, most communities have uh, access to uh, uh, an online research to find locations and, and, and sites. So I think ideally you, they would find a professional and, and, and hook up with them and have a relationship. And lastly, I would say that's sort of that warm handoff. And in fact, you know, the 5A, 5A model is what, what we often talk about. It's what we do for most issues that come up in the office. I think it really applies here. So we assess. That's the screening part uh, that's really important to do. We advise based on what that assessment shows. Again, exactly what we do for other conditions. Um, you know, based on that, we, we're going to offer, offer to assist. Uh, what do we need to do to help? And we're going we're gonna to work on arranging follow-up to get the patient out. So following those steps, there's, there's, a, there's a process to get through. We do that for other uh, conditions as well. So I think that's more of the same. And again, to your question about resources, that's how we know we need resources. Where's the spot where our system's not going to be able to handle this and we're going to hand off to somebody else? Um, increasingly, we're seeing organizations bring that in-house. In I think there's lots of, of, of good, sustainable, fundable ways to bring behavioral health and in, integrate that into primary care. I think it's the future. Um, it's where places are going. So I would recommend any site, any practice, be looking at how they're going to do that, assuming it needs to happen, whether it's a referral, a co-located, or ideally fully integrated, which I think is the model to bring. These are great, great suggestions. Um, what are the take-home points today that you really yeah. want people to remember about alcohol misuse right. and screening and, and programs? Yeah, thanks for asking that. I think that's important. So the bottom line to me is just make this um, as important as everything else that we do. It just becomes part of what we do. I think the evidence supports that there's a prevalence that warrants our action. The evidence supports there are simple, effective, primary care-based care interventions that can be used. Um, there's plenty of evidence that people who do that are effective at doing that, and it doesn't turn patients off. I think patients are, appreciate having that model. Um, and there are tools and resources available that do just what we normally do with everything else. So um, we always like to say with all these improvement models, what are you going to do by next Tuesday? So I think you know, the practices ought to sort of look at this and say, what are we going to do by next Tuesday to, to have a system in place up and running and then start the improvement process? It won't be perfect overnight. But um, I think just simply putting the system in place will get the ball rolling and, and the process will do. And again, just do what we do for everything else. It works. Very helpful suggestions. Thank you so much. We appreciate the time. Thank you. Nice to be here. Thank you.